Thank you, thank you so much for that round of applause. It means so much from the bottom of my heart. It is so great to be here tonight. Tonight is a very special night because we're going to be talking about miracles. Not only understanding miracles and having stories about miracles and going into some personal stories that happened in my life, but we're going to be talking about the manifestation of miracles, how it can become an affirmation throughout your own life. And before I do that, I want to tell a quick story real quick. There was this hunter out in the woods, and he came across a bear. And this bear was getting ready to eat him. So he got down on his hands and knees and said, God, please make this bear a believer. And then all of a sudden, something extraordinary happened. The bear got down on his hands and knees and said, Thank you, God, so much for this food. Amen. <laughs> nice to have a little church humor. And you know, when it comes to miracles, you think of Jesus Christ. And it says right here in Luke 7.22, so he replied to the, to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those that have, have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf ear the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. The miracles that Jesus Christ did himself. When there was a fish and a loaf of bread, he said, how am I going to feed the masses? They asked my Lord. And he fed them. And he made sure everybody had a fish and a loaf of bread. The miracles were for Christ alone proves that miracles are not just by mistake, but they are by design. One of the people that inspire me very much, and I think that he inspires all of us at a higher level, would be Mahati Gandhi. One of the things that he said, there are only two ways to live your life. As though nothing is a miracle, or that through everything is a miracle. Mahati Gandhi. What he did by himself within his mind and his movement created miracles and transcended miracles into action. When they had their meetings and everybody wanted to fight the British soldiers. And what did Gandhi say? We will not strike a blow. And what Mahati Gandhi said would happen, happened. He said, we will bring them to their knees. Speaking about the British soldiers. And by bringing them to their knees, they will feel our pain. And by feeling our pain, they will leave India. He spoke it into existence and made it happen. He transcended the idea. But we are connected to God. We are connected to a source. We are connected to a power that is higher than us. He connected to that source. And through nonviolence, he transcended this to be reality. Then you have the story of Lamach and Mayapagiza, the story of Left to Tell, about a lady that survived in the bathroom for 91 days during the Rwanda genocide. And those of you that know Dr. Wayne Dyer, that have listened to the story, that have heard him speak on it, that have heard her speak on it, they know the miracles that were manifested in this situation. Through her connection through God, she made miracles happen. And the manifestations that happened and the miracles that she created through her faith in God was so extraordinary and so dynamic, she transcended another level of her spirit to create miracles. Many times, these killers with machetes that were Hutus came in to look for her in this single bungalow home. They could not find the bathroom. She was in a bathroom that was the size of a closet with seven other women for 91 days. And I don't want to really get much into this story, 
read the book Left to Tell or listen to Dr. Wayne Dyer's video on it. But it was a story that brought me to my knees and transformed me. And that's why, I'm, I, that's why I bring it up. But for her faith in God, she transcended her faith to create miracles. And you know, there's another gentleman named Layman Abbott that was a Christian scholar from the mid-1800s that lived in New York City. He had this quote. A miracle no longer seems to me a manifestation of extraordinary power, but an extraordinary manifestation of ordinary power. God is always showing himself like God showed himself in the situation in Rwanda, the lady in the bathroom. The parables of Christ, how he constantly showed himself. The situation with Gandhi. The situation with Nelson Mandela. As Nelson Mandela changed the, not only the outlook in South Africa, but he changed the whole outlook in Africa itself. As he came out with reconciliation and forgiveness and changed the world. And changed Africa. Because miracles are not by accident. They're not by coincidence. They are by design. This universe, through God, has everything laid out at the right place, the right time, when it's supposed to happen, how it's supposed to happen. And if you feel like you can manifest miracles in your own life for any situation, for any problem, for anything, it can be done. There's something bigger than us that moves the universe that we need to connect to. And when we can learn to connect to that, we can manifest not only miracles for ourselves, but miracles for other people as well. Just like Nelson Mandela. Just like Gandhi. But it's got to come from divine love. It's got to come from non-judgmentalness. It's got to come from a source of God that is so powerful. And that source of God that is so powerful is complete love. Just complete divine love. When you can forgive somebody that has done the worst atrocities, that has done the worst things to you, and love that person. You know, it's absolutely a coincidence, but I'm sitting here talking about the Makame of Giza from the story Left to Tell from Rwanda, and I had a conversation with somebody last night that's a very dear friend of mine in Georgia. And he's actually Rwandan. He's from Uganda, but he's actually Rwandan. He's, he's a Tutsi. And one of the things we were talking about was learning how to love those that, that hurt you. And it was hard for him to have love towards the Hutus and what they did to his family. And only one can imagine the pain and suffering and anger that you have when you saw what a group of people can do to people that you love. I can understand his anger and hostility towards it. But one of the things I told him, I'm like, you've got to learn how to love those people. Even the people that did those atrocities. You've got to learn how to love them. And when you come to that place in divine love, that is when miracles happen. That is when the doors and floodgates open. And it hasn't been just a manifestation I've been working on within my own life. But it's a manifestation that is a universal principle in law. You can look up just about any philosopher from any time. If it's Patanjali from India, philosophers from Africa, philosophers from China, philosophers from America, philosophers from Europe, anywhere, any place, any time, and it's always a universal law. If you can have love in your heart, absolutely divine love, even towards the people that do the worst atrocities, 
and love those people. Miracles and manifestations will happen beyond belief. Now I'm going to kind of get into some miracles that have happened to me personally. There are times back in the mid-2000s I asked myself, is it a miracle that I'm here? Is it a miracle that I'm standing before you right now talking? But I realized all this was manifested. All this had a predestined course. If it did not have a predestined course, I wouldn't be here talking to you in front of 2,000 people right now at this moment in time. But I remember back in 2010, and the years before that were, were not good years to me. Did not have good connection with my family. Did not have a good support system around me. Did not have a good financial structure. Did not really have a financial plan. It's like I was living day to day, week to week, month to month. And I think we all still do that to a degree, but finances were just not, they seemed like a curse to me back then more than they seemed like a gift. And it was to the point where it was during the recession. And me being a professional painter, painting houses and painting commercial buildings, those jobs were not steady at that time. 2010, I had to find a new profession, and delivering pizzas seemed to be the only thing I could make a living at at the time. And I remember I was working for Domino's Pizza in North Phoenix, and I delivered a pizza to a bad area, a pretty much all the sunny slope, area is pretty much a drug infested area. For those of you that know Phoenix, Arizona, everybody knows that. You know, you're not exactly going to find the most prosperity when it comes to sunny slope. It was 11 o'clock at night. It was dark. I was out making my pizza runs for Domino's Pizza and I delivered a pizza to this one apartment complex in a sunny slope area, pretty much north of Hatcher. And everybody knows if you've driven down Hatcher, Hatcher Drive, it's not exactly the most extravagant drive to drive down. Usually at night, most people prefer to use Dunlap or, or prefer to pretty much go around that area for those reasons. So I'm delivering a pizza. It's 11 o'clock at night. And I just got done with my delivery. And I go to my car. And this guy walks up and points a gun right at my head. He says, I need you to give me your car and your wallet. Most of the time I would say, yeah, you got a gun. Why not? But something happened to me at that moment in time. But I could not explain. I, I felt a spirit within me. Understand, I was going to church. I was more religious than I was spiritually inclined at that time. And the spirit just came over me. And I looked right at him. I said, in the name of Jesus, you cannot have my car and my wallet. And his voice got louder. He's like, you know, I got the gun here. <laughs> it's like, I don't think you heard me. I need you to give me your car and your wallet now. And I said, you cannot have my car or wallet. For all the powers invested in me, for the power of God, you cannot have my car or wallet. And part of me is like, what the hell did I just do? But in reality, I felt the spirit in me at that moment that was complete power, that was complete peace, that was complete serenity, 
That was complete, unconditional love. And I knew at that place in time, nothing was going to happen to me. I could not explain it. And I could write a million books on it. And I probably could not explain that moment and place and time. Neither of us really can because we're, when we're connected to God, extraordinary miracles happen and this was an extraordinary miracle. And as soon as I said that, he dropped the gun on the ground and ran off. And understand, the hairs on my arms are standing up. And I'm absolutely in awe of what just happened. That was the one moment when I realized I was connected to something other than myself. But I was connected to a source of God at that place in time that was there to protect me no matter what. And who knows the story on that guy? Maybe he was desperate for money. Maybe he didn't have a job for a couple of weeks and he didn't know how to feed his family. I had no idea what his situation was. All I know was God was going to make sure not only that I was protected, but he was protected too and he was not going to do something that he regret. And looking back, I thought it was God protecting me, but today, after understanding how miracles work, it wasn't just God protecting me, it was God protecting him too. Maybe he had a family and maybe that moment would have put him in prison for the rest of his life where he would never see his family again. And those are the things you've got to think about when you see miracles. It's not just the miracle that happens to you, it's a, it's a miracle that happens to the other person, the other people in this situation. And you know, the thing about the universe... It always reconfirms the miracles that you have by giving you more than one. <laughs> and I definitely have more than one to share today. Something even more extraordinary happened in 2011. Almost a year later. And I remember 2011, finances were really, really tight. I just started a new job. I just went from Domino's to Pizza Hut. I, I traded one bad situation pretty much for another bad situation. And finances were so tight. And it was such a stressful day because I just got the job. I was supposed to start work in two days. And my car starts overheating on me. And understand, I'm driving a 2004 Cavalier, Chevrolet Cavalier. It's black. It's faded black, has about 189,000 miles on it, and I have one more payment left, and guess what, it's mine. <laughs> oh, hooray, Rippy, I'm so excited. But blessings actually happen in the skies, we just don't know it. So anyways... My stepfather comes out and helps me put a new fan in my car. And I was going through such a depression moment in my life. I was going someplace I shouldn't have went. And when I was going someplace I shouldn't have went, somebody hopped in front of my car with a gun. Pointed it right at my glass, right at my head towards my glass. And he says, I'm carjacking you. And this person had such a dark vibe and a scary vibe. This person was probably on drugs, most likely, but this person had no empathy, had no heart, had no soul. You know that your life is in the balance at that place in time and at that moment. And if I get emotional, please forgive me, because I've never talked about this in public. I've never even told my family, anybody in my family about it, until this year I told my stepfather like about three or four weeks ago. Very, very few selected people that I told about this. So he gets in the car next to me, points the gun at me, 
Hey, at this place in time, I know that my life is in question. There's not a doubt in my mind. He makes me drive three miles down the road to downtown Glendale. And we're in a neighborhood in downtown Glendale. A lot of old houses. Old, old, very old neighborhood. And I see him put five more bullets inside the gun because there was one in there but he wanted to put five more in there and he wanted me to see him put five more in there. So moving on from the situation I started feeling that spirit again. I was scared to death but I also felt that spirit at the same time. It's like God's like is reconfirming that he was right there with me at this place in time. The universe is confirming his spirit is right there. And I just have this calmness and this peaceful peacefulness and this bliss and I know nothing's going to happen to me but I still have that fear but I've never felt in my life. It's like time was frozen during this moment. It's like time was standing still as this moment was happening. That's exactly what it felt like. As he parks the car beside a house in downtown Glendale, Arizona, he takes me out of the car. And he takes me and puts me up against a pony wall. Pony wall is about five feet high. I'm about six feet high. And I, I'm like, this could be it right here. And I have all these things going through my mind. Does my mother know that I love her? Does everybody know that I love them? Even though I felt the spirit, I still had those things going through my mind. And he pulled the trigger. And I'm thinking that I'm shot. And I'm thinking that my life is over at this moment. Forgive me. And I'm feeling around. My body, I'm like feeling where I got shot at. Where the blood's coming out. He gets in some kind of trance and kind of looks at me like he was getting ready to shoot me again because I was still standing. And he kind of got in some kind of trance and got in the car and took off. And I'm feeling around my body. I'm like, where did I get hit at? And I'm feeling no blood on me at all. And I'm like, what just happened? I said, it must have been, one of those bullets must have been a blank. Then I look behind me. Then I look behind me when I realized I did not get shot. And I realized at the upper part of the fence, where he put me up against, there was a bullet hole right in the fence. Right then and there, I knew a miracle had taken place, for I was protected. All that fear just went away. Even when I felt just a little bit of fear and I was sad, it's like I knew that I was being protected at that moment. It was really hard to describe. It still makes me want to cry to this day because I felt like my life was over at that moment. And I'm running down the street trying to see if somebody's home so I can call the police. And, and I'm running down the street like Adrian Peterson. I've never ran this fast in my life. I'm running blocks like nothing. 
And I get about four blocks down the road, and it's, going, it's pretty much like 11.15, 11.10, 11.15 after this happened, somewhere around that time frame. And somebody is sitting outside their porch smoking a cigarette, and that's when I had them call the police and went back to the spot where it happened from. And nothing even hit me until like 4 o'clock in the morning. I felt this bliss and this empowerment inside me, but I was protected by God, and that didn't go away. Just a sheer confidence, a sheer love, a sheer unconditional love that I just felt. But I knew at this place in time that I was protected. And long story short, the car already had a claim on it, from the hailstorm that pretty much damaged every car in the vicinity for miles in 2011. There's like golf ball sized hail that dented every car. So I already had an insurance claim on that two weeks later the car gets carjacked. I mean the car had 200,000 miles, it was faded black, I had one more payment. Somebody wants to carjack my car. I'm like, okay, let me go ahead and get my tools out. You go ahead and take it. Thank you. <laughs> Only if it was that easy. And the insurance company made a mistake on the, on the odometer. The car had 189,000 miles on it, and the insurance company put 89,000 miles on it. And this is not even the end of the story. I'm at Walmart in my rent a car that the insurance company gave me. Six days later, I parked right next to my car that was carjacked. Didn't even know it. Had no idea that it was even there until I came out. Walked right by it, didn't even pay attention. As when I'm walking out, I'm like, this car kind of looks like mine. Then I noticed it was stripped. Then I noticed a few dents that I recognized. I'm like, ah, oh, this is my car. And what was so amazing, everything was taken out of that car except the, except the Bible that my great-grandfather gave me. And I was really struggling for money at that time. And $300 came out of that, that Bible. It was not only a miracle through the situation, but and I don't even remember putting the $300 in the Bible, but yet it came out of the Bible at the right place and time that I needed it. And I'm trying to think back in my mind, when did I put this $300 in the Bible? I don't remember. And I ended up getting an insurance check for a car of 189,000 miles for $4,400 after the last payment was paid. It definitely deserves your applause. It definitely does. So as I got a new vehicle days after from the insurance giving me a check, I was delivering a pizza again Except this time it was Pizza Hut. It was it was an apartment complex on 7th Street and Thomas in Central Phoenix, and everybody knows that apartment complex is not exactly the most friendliest apartment complex when it comes to late at night. And as I was delivering a pizza, I walked halfway in the complex, and I was walking back out to the street where my SUV I just bought was sitting on the street. I had a voice tell me, walk back to where you came from. These two guys are going to rob you. It was a small, steady voice that I'd never heard before in my life. It just spoke to me. And I knew these two guys were going to rob me, and they knew that I knew when I seen them. It's like they knew it. The secret was out. They knew it. They knew that I knew, and I started walking back, and then I started running back. And at the exact place and time where I actually ran back, they caught up to me, put a gun to my head, 
shook me upside down, took my wallet, took my keys to my vehicle that I just bought. There was an ex-cop on the second level. That was a bridge that was pretty much where we were pretty much where I was pretty much positioned that right underneath on the apartment complex that connected one apartment building to the other. He pulled his gun and threatened to shoot him. They both took off. And understand they had my keys. Now this is another miracle through God that I can't explain. My neighbor who lives about four or five doors down, very strong trust with him. I gave him the key to my, my condo. Something just told me that I needed to give him the key to my condo. I don't know what it was, but I listened to what, what I was told. So I gave him the key to my condo. I called him up. I told him what happened. I said, I have a spare key. He brought my keys to my new SUV that I bought. It wasn't a new SUV, but it was a newer vehicle than what I had. I was able to recar the vehicle without it getting stolen. Miracle after miracle after miracle in every single situation like it was predestined and preplanned. You can't explain it, but you know, and you have a knowing within your heart that it existed. And there was another situation in 2016 where two people knocked on my door and powered their way into my place. And I found my way in myself and powered myself out in my house. Taking punch after punch, hit after hit, being attacked, almost having a string around my neck, flipping the guy over my back, not even realizing that I did what I did. As I'm getting punched by these two people that, that attacked me in my house in 2016, I threw my car keys and my wallet underneath the bed without them knowing. You understand, I'm fighting one guy as the other one's going through my drawers looking for everything. And it's like I found my way to the front door. I don't know how I did it. It was by the grace of God by every single martial arts move I, I could think of that I got out. My clothes were ripped off. I was pretty much covering myself because my pants were ripped, my shirt was ripped. Neighbor gave me a towel, called the police. They got nothing out of my place. They took off. And they tried to start my car with a mailbox key. Something told me to throw my keys underneath my bed and my wallet underneath my bed as I was getting punched and taking a beating from these guys. And what was so amazing is you could see the stream mark where they tried to stream me, but I got beat up by these guys pretty bad. And not, not only did it not show on the face, I didn't even feel any pain from anything that they did when it came to hitting me. I at least got hit about 30 times. But I didn't feel anything afterwards, and I didn't see anything from, from any of that. It was like I was being protected again. I want everybody to know that there is a God that loves us so deeply and so confoundly that His love for us cannot measure up to anything that we can give Him. These miracles were just not there for me, but they're there for the people trying to hurt me as well, as I mentioned before. Everything has a design and purpose for the universe, for our source of God. Everything is connected for our source of God. And before I get off this platform tonight, I want to say that we are all one. It doesn't matter what our skin color is. It doesn't matter our nationality, our religion, our political preference, or even what sports team we cheer for. We are all one. And we have forgotten that. And we have lost consciousness with the fact that we are one.
Islamic philosopher from the 1200s named Rumi. But I have to share this quote with you because it's so confound and so honest and so true. He says, we are all just a drop of water in the ocean and God is our ocean. In other words, what he's trying to say is when we start trying to disconnect and make it about ourselves, it is ego. We cannot be that drop of water without the ocean. We do not have the power to be that drop of water without the ocean. But we allow our egos to take over and realize for our ego that wants more, that doesn't have compassion, that doesn't have empathy. All it wants is more. All it cares about is survival. All it cares about what it wants. It doesn't care about anything else. And this ego that is a drop of water without being connected to the ocean feels that it's more powerful than the ocean and more powerful than God and more powerful than everything around us. But in reality... We are all one. And we're in such a society where we're told that we are not all one, but we are all separated when we are not all separated. I put a quote on my Facebook wall. It says, No branches are foolish enough to fight themselves. And what that quote means, which is a native proverb, it means we all come from the same tree. No branches are foolish enough to fight themselves. And when we can find love and drop our egos, and we can learn to find love without that ego, not only will miracles manifest to you, but what you speak into existence will happen. No different than what Gandhi spoke into existence. No different than what Nelson Mandela spoke into existence. It becomes a divine power connected through God that is out of this world. Because what did, what did Christ say? He says, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. It means that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And when we can connect to that source and realize that we are all one, no matter what situation, not only will a lot of the pain and suffering go away, and the division and the hatred, and the separation, and the anxiety, and the depression. But we will be in the designed realm of God that he has planned out throughout the whole universe. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I want everybody to know that you are a piece of God. Every single person in this room and every single person listening to this is a divine Peace of God. There is a destined path for you. There is a destined path for every single person. And miracles are not just by coincidence. They are by design. Thank you so much. And may God bless each one of you.